novel. Such a good, such a good short story. I absolutely recommend reading Dagon. It takes like 10 minutes to read. I could read it on stream. I could do a reading stream where I read Dagon. <laughs> It it is it is really it's, it's like super fucking good. Okay, oh, I should take my mitts. That is quite loud. I will say that it's quite loud. Let us turn it down. Why is there no music fucking slider? God damn it. Okay. What do we got? Autoplay? Oh, that's cool. So you can just literally use it as a movie. Okay, that's 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 pretty awesome. Oh, and you can change the text. Okay, yeah, I like that a lot. Um, let's turn on. I forgot. Do I like FXAA or TAA more? It doesn't matter. Turn off VC and motion blur though. Trivia. So it looks like I get. Yeah, and then these are the other two ones. I'll I'll, I'll play those DLC eventually. Um, I'll play those DLC when they when they get the. The free DLC. I'll play it all in one like DLC stream or whatever. But um, yeah, let's just start. Dagon is a faithful interactive adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's work focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action sequences, or inventory management here, and movement is limited progressing through locations along with the plot. That's completely I'm fine. This under an appreciable mental Ooh. strain, since by tonight I shall be no Oh, such a classic line. Oh my god. Okay, I need to turn on the... I can make this like the same volume, I think. That is such a classic ass line. I love that line so much. Oh, during the game, you will encounter interactive elements. Some of them will allow you to continue your journey. Others reveal interesting facts about the original short story, its historical background, and the author. Some of the trivia is hidden. In order to find these secrets, focus your eyes and look for the elder sign. Ah, okay. Lovecraft's letters. See, this is very interesting to me because I, I love Lovecraft show. As to letters, my case is peculiar. I write such things exactly as easily and rapid and as rapidly as I would utter the same topics in conversation. Indeed. Ep oh my god, okay, yeah, that's the worst part about reading Lovecraft though. <laughs> he, he's fucking old and racist, so he uses or he used big words. Epistolary expression is with me largely replacing conversation as my condition of nervous prostration becomes more and more acute. I cannot bear to talk much now, and in becoming as silent as the spectator himself, my loquacity. <laughs> what the hell is a loquacity? I gotta see what's a look. Okay, this is good. This game doesn't minimize. I can go to my other monitor and you don't see my empty desktop. Loquacity is um, the quality of taking a great deal. Talkativeness. My talkativeness extends itself on paper. H.P. Lovecraft to Reinhardt Cleaner. Throughout his life, Lovecraft pinned around 100,000 letters. What is wrong with you if you do that, bro? To his friends and fans, out of which about 10%. I would love, like, imagine just being able to just write Lovecraft a letter. My god. Out of which about 10% survived to this day. But his tendency to endless correspondence was a relatively late growth. In youth, I scarcely did any letter writing, <clears throat> thinking anybody for a present was so much of an ordeal that I would rather have written a 250-line pastoral for a 20-page theatis on the rings of Saturn. <laughs> Selected letters, 1929 to 1931. Lovecraft would often skip meals to avoid post to afford postage. Collections of his correspondence have been published in various books, and selected letters can be found online. Some readers consider them his most important legacy. That's insane. You can read the discovered trivia immediately or go back to them later in the main menu. Turn off displaying trivia if you find the feature distracts you from the story. No, I like reading it. Plus, I've already know the story. You don't, but I do, so, you know. What is my FPS right now? This feels like, you can like, like a 60 or something? I don't know. Okay, so I'm in, this is my apartment where you know, the window. Every, 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 you know, every Dagon fan knows the window. Any other Dagon fans? Penniless, and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life Morphine! Enjoyable, I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. 
Do not think from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. Do we got any symbols? We got any we got any symbols laying around here? No, no symbols? This isn't really what I imagine Lovecraft's room to look like in like this story. I imagine kind of like an attic. But I guess this is more likely to be the case. I doubt Lovecraft. Oh, okay. I don't. The character doesn't have a name, right? I guess I, Lovecraft. I, I I would think you know Lovecraft like wouldn't live in an attic. But when you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. Okay, maybe now I can. No. So we have question mark. Oh, is that a... Morphine. Morphine, okay, I love fun facts about morphine. Morphine entered into use in the 19th century and was routinely administered to treat severe pain during the American Civil War and World War One. It was also sold without restrictions until not June 14. Right, it was done that. I forgot. Morphine became more popular after the invention of the hypodermic syringe around 1950, 1854. Frederick Serdenter, who first isolated this substance, originally named it Morphium after Morpheus, the Greek god associated with dreams. At the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as soldier disease, already posed a big problem in the United States. Oh, I love this story so much. Which I was oh, shut up. Cargo, fell a victim to the German sea raider. I wonder. Oh, yeah, look at that. Lovecraft and the Great War. Dagon was written around a month after the United States entered World War I. Lovecraft was actively interested in his course. He composed many poems in which he get. I would be. I mean, I would be interested too. Imagine now World War Three happens. I would be writing poems about that shit. Which he gave encouragement to soldiers and commented on the events unfolding in Europe. He tried to enlist in the army, which he mentions in one of the letters to Reinhard Kleiner, some time ago. Impressed by my entire usefulness, oh uselessness in the world, I resolved to attempt enlistment despite my almost invalid condition. I argue, I argue that if I chose a regiment soon to depart for France, my sheer nervous force, which is not inconsiderable, might sustain me till a bu till a bullet or piece of shrapnel could more conclusively and effectively dispose of me. But even though he passed the physical exam, his mother prevented him from going to war. She has threatened to go any lengths, legal or otherwise, if I do not reveal all the if I do not reveal all the ills which unfit me for the army. I am Providence, the life and times of HP Oh yeah, he was he was in Providence, Rhode Island. What the hell lives in Providence other than him? It's wrong, Joey and Woody, my goats. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation. So that our vessel was made a legitimate prize, whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. The Huns? Or the Huns? The Huns were Central Asian nomads. Okay, I was saying Huns thinking it was German. I'll just say Huns. The Huns were Central Asian nomads who established a dominion in Europe and invaded the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. They were known as brutal, deadly warriors and masters of quick raids who also developed powerful composite bows, lassos, and early siege weapons. Mm. During World War I, the British used the, world, the, the word Hun as a synonym. Okay, yeah, so it is German. They used the word Hun as a synonym for Germans. In order to emphasize the brutality, however, the term originated when the German Empire Wil Wilhelm II gave a speech to his troops on 27th July 1900 before they embarked to China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into our into your hands is forfeited. Just as just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under the king. Attila made a name for themselves, one that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. May the, na may, may the name German be affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever, will ever, will ever again dare to 
look cross-eyed at a German. It's crazy. The refusal to take prisoners with a clear breach of the laws and customs of wards after the first hate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't just do that, bro. This game looks really good. Like graphically, I mean. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. <sighs> oh, that's how I continue? No secrets? Okay. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Never a competent navigator, I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. Oh, that's so beautiful. So beautiful. Of the longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. God damn, this game is beautiful. Look, look at that moon. That's so fucking beautiful. There has to be some sort of. Hi, Claire. This is, um, you messaged me. I'm checking your message. Oh, it's mysterious. 10.2.2024. I'm writing, producing one song a day and oh. This is Dagon. It is, um, I love Dagon. HP Lovecraft. It's one of my favorite stories. And a few years ago, they made a, uh, interactive story of it and it's really fucking good because i it's so beautiful and it's such a beautiful story it inspired it inspired me so much fair, and for uncounted yeah, no. days i drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land <laughs> no not like harry potter like dagon by hp lovecraft i was showing you my blender projects remember that one with the with the eyeball that was supposed to be dagon <laughs> the weather cut oh yeah um and just aimlessly beneath the scorching sun waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some inhabitable land the return to short stories Dagon was written in July 1917 and first published in 1919 in The Vagrant, an amateur magazine focused on the supernatural. Sto Why don't we just have magazines? The story is the first of his stories that introduced an element from the Cthulhu mythos, Dagon itself. A pagan cult worshipping Dagon later appears in The Shadow Over Innsmouth. I really need to read that. One of Lovecraft's most popular works. I haven't read, read, read like his most popular ones. H.P. Lovecraft, J.K. Rowling, I'm Bigford. What is I'm Bigford? I've I've read um, the color of Zahn. That one's really good. I I want to read a lot, but it just takes so much brain power. Oh, you know I'll do it soon. Uh, 1917 is also the year when he wrote The Tomb, a story about Jervis Dudley, a daydreamer who discovers a mysterious mausoleum in the woods by his house and becomes obsessed with it. These two works marked Lovecraft's return to short story writing after he burned most of his attempts at the genre nine, at the genre nine years prior and decided to concentrate on poetry. Lovecraft stated that it was his friend William Cook Paul. A literary publisher and critic who convinced him to start writing weird fiction again. Dude, imagine. Imagine if William Paul Cook. Did I say William Cook? Paul? Okay. Imagine if William Paul Cook was never was like, hey, you should go write some weird fiction. Imagine. We, we wouldn't have any of Lovecraft shit. That's crazy. Lovecraft is so fucking good. It's just so hard to read. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken blue. The change happened whilst I slept. Its details I shall never know. For my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. It's Dagon Land. Oh, this is so cool seeing it visually. God, I love this fucking story so much. We should make a Minecraft map. We're making a lot of things, Claire. 
Minecraft map would be fun to make, though. I feel like we should make this RPG. I mean, we could do... I don't know. We'll see. We should make a child. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous undulations as far as I could see. And in which my boat lay grounded some distance away. Though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery, I was in reality more horrified than astonished. The unspeakable horrors. For there was in the air, and in the rotting soil, a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. The region was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish, and of other, less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Perhaps I should I love his writing so much. in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. He made so many classics by just saying unutterable hideousness. You cannot speak of these horrors. There was nothing within hearing, and nothing in sight, save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black in its cloudless cruelty, as though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. So fucking cool. Seeing, like, someone else's interpretation of what, like, the visuals were. Look at this little squid guy. Okay, I don't think I can see anything here, though. What the fuck? <laughs> don't make those sounds at me. As I crawled into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Big fish theory. Through some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, a portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface, exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I bad news for you. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. That's a sea fowl. Okay, let's see. Oh, that's a very big one. The mystery of volcanic islands. Volcanic eruptions sometimes result in the creation of islands. Most of them are transient and erode after some time, but some are permanent. Permanent. The floating pumice porous rocks created when superheated pressured rock is ejected from a volcano can move across long distances and transport barnacles and micro macro algae that cling to it in 2001 rafts of pumice created during the eruption of a volcano near tonga polynesia eventually reached australia that's my favorite lovecraft fun fact it's about pumice for several hours, I sat thinking or brooding in the boat, which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. <laughs> that night, I slept but little, and the next day, I made for myself a pack containing food and water preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished sea and possible rescue. This game is so pretty. Look, look, look at the moon and its reflection. On the... God, look at this. No light pollution. On the third morning, I found the soil dry enough Oh my god, this shader is insane. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. God damn. 
This is so beautiful. I love the ambient music too. All day I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on the rolling desert. I remember when I was reading this, I had to look up what hummock was because I thought, I was like, what do you mean there's a hammock? It's not just a hammock. And I was like, oh, hummock is a very old word for a mound. Okay. Every time I read Lovecraft, I always had to look up like every other word I was reading. This definitely, it's, this definitely feels like the writing has changed because unless this story is just not as complex, uh, literarily, literary, in, in literal literary terms. Hello. <laughs> Little guy. I'm just, look at this. It's so beautiful. That night, I encamped, and on the following day still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. Espied means to have noticed. The horrors of the ocean. The creator of the Cthulhu mythos and the fictional underwater city of, Ry of R Ry Raya, I can never pronounce these fucking weird ass words, was convinced that life could not exist at the bottom of the ocean because the water pressure would make it uninhabitable. Today we know that the darkest depths of the ocean are home to many per peculiar organisms. The deepest dwelling fish we have dis discovered so far, the Mariana snailfish, can live about 8,000 meters, more than 26,000 feet below the ocean surface, never-ending darkness, and at hellishly crushing pressures, hundreds of times stronger than those found at sea level. Upon glancing at the modern photos of deep, she cre of deep sea creatures such as the anglerfish, the fangtooth, or the viperfish, and their truly Lovecraftian characteristics, it's hard not to find some irony in this. Right? What the fuck is a fangtooth or a viperfish? Like, yeah, they like they like knew this shit before. That's crazy. Like, this, this is like Lovecraft, but real. Can you believe it? I really love the bottom of the ocean. I want to go there. Here we go. Evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance. An intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. Too weary to ascend, I slept in the shadow of the hill. I know not why my dreams were so wild that night. But ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain. I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. It's writing so fucking and good. in the glow of the moon I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Picking up my pack, I started for the crest of the eminence. Let's see. There's like weird shimmers there that keep looking like they're going to be a funny little secret. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plain was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon, whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. That's such, like, I fucking, 
<gasps> That's such a crazy sentence. Peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. If you ever, if you ever like read my writing, which you might find somewhere, I don't know. You'll notice that it's very similar to Lovecraft, with like these weird ass, like adjectives. Because I love it so much. It's just so good. It just, it's just, it's like fuck. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost and of Satan's hideous climb through the unfashioned realms of darkness. As the moon climbed higher in the sky, I began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as I had imagined. See? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's anything here. Ledges and outcroppings of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent. Whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. Let's see. Any markings here? No. Urged oh, I love that ambience. Impulse, which I cannot definitely analyze. I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. This is the, uh, in my Dagon Blender thing, that was the little monolith. Mine was a lot smaller than this. <laughs> Mine was like tiny in comparison. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. This is the monolith. He's pretty cool. That it was merely a gigantic piece of stone, I soon assured myself. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. I love this ambience. For despite its enormous magnitude and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young, I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship of living and thinking creatures. Dazed and frightened, yet not without a certain thrill of the scientist's or archaeologist's delight, I examined my surroundings more closely. See, what I imagine this was, is I imagine that he was like in a cave at this point, which is why my, uh, my render of it was in a cave, because I imagine like a cave, not like this kind of valley area. Zenith shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm and revealed the fact that a far flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the Cyclopean monolith, on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. I didn't put any I didn't put any descriptions on mine. Fuck. Let's see. Any water facts? No, no water facts. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown to me, and unlike anything I'd ever seen in books. Consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world, but whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean risen plain. That's so fucking cool. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. 
Look at that guy. Storytelling methods. Dagon contains many themes of storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later work, such as telling the story through carvings at the Mountains of Madness, the Nameless City, journals and character notes, islands emerging from the ocean, or fictional beings and deities based on real events and mythologies. It's also considered the origin of the popular Cthulhu mythos. Some of Lovecraft's other stories also conclude in a matter similar to Dagon. Ending is so good. Plainly visible across the intervening water, on account of their enormous size, were an array of bas reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Dore. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, at least a certain sort of men. Though the creatures were shown disporting like fishes in the waters of some marine grotto, mermaid men, or paying homage at some monolithic shrine which appeared to be under the waves as well. Yes, yeah, so we've got a... This is the ocean, and we've got a shrine under here, and there's little mermaid men worshipping it, like where we are right now. Of their faces and forms, I dare not speak in detail. For the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet. Shockingly wide and flabby lips, glassy, bulging eyes, and other features less pleasant to recall. Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger Ooh. than himself. I remarked, as I say, their grotesqueness and strange size but in a moment decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring tribe. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist, I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the queer. silent channel before me. Like me. Then, suddenly, I saw it. With only a slight churning to mark its rise to the surface, the thing slid into view above the dark waters. Last, polyphemus like and loathsome, it darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the monolith. About which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. I think I went mad then. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. See, like that, I, again, I, I like seeing different people's interpretation because I, 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 I didn't interpret Dagon looking like that at all. He looked like a big gorilla guy. <laughs> I believe I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. so much and then hey, look. I came out of the shadows we're in San Francisco hospital. <laughs> it's always so funny to me how we go from like that you know wasteland to San Francisco brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean in my delirium I had said much but found that my words had been given scant attention. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. 
nor did I deem it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. The journalist. Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journal journalism. In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative, which included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, and literary criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, but he also took criticisms to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentrate on weird fiction. Again, for the first time since his teenage years, Dagon, published in 1919, is one of the short stories written during that period. In this, exam in this example, expert from the conservative, the master of horror fiction explains his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. Why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of universal peace is more than a conservative can fathom. Should the entire civilized world agree simultaneously to disarm, one or more nations would undoubtedly retain secret arm armaments and at the proper time take advantage of their moral, altruistic, and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is or ever can be above warfare until the basic impulse of the human animal shall have miraculously changed. I get what he's saying. I feel you, Lovecraft. See, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to like agree with anything that Lovecraft says, just out of being careful about. <laughs> In defense of Dagon, in 1921, Lovecraft released a series of three essays: "The Difference Reopens," "The Difference Remains Open," and "Final Words." later published a collection entitled In Defense of Dagon, in which he rebuked a series of criticisms directed at his work. Some notable quotes. I paint what I dream and will let the public settle the rest amongst themselves. So real. Mr. Monday asks the, the raisin deter... Okay, what the hell is that weird-ass phrase that I've never heard of before in my life? I think that's a... What do they speak in Ivory Coast? In, in the Coast d'Ivoire? They, um, what do they speak here? Wikipedia, help me. What is your language? What, what is your fucking language? Oh, French. Right. This looks French. Um, it is the most important reason or purpose for someone or something's existence. It does not mean cat. Ask the reason of his existence of Dagon, I will give it purely and simply to reproduce a mood. Its object is the simplest in all, in all art, portrayal. This, the physical horrors of war, no matter how extreme and unprecedented, hardly have a bearing on the entirely different realm of supernatural terror. Ghosts are still ghosts. The mind can get more thrills from unrealities than from realities. In the essays, Lovecraft touches upon the topics of atheism, materialism, the quest for truth, and love of science. No, his cat's name. Oh, I'm gonna do. A, I'm gonna do an impression of like an of like an AI chatbot. Lovecraft experienced wide criticism for the name of his cat. Hold on, I always I always forget to turn off mod icons so I can fucking immediately. Banned probable lubricant. <laughs> That's such a funny account name. <laughs> Hold on, let me add. How what what? How long into the stream is this? Like two hours, ten minutes. Okay. Um. Yeah see another thing here. The atheist. Lovecraft was himself an atheist and absolute materialist, which he attributed partly to his early childhood, interested in astronomy and science in general. In his own words, I am indeed an absolute materialist so far as actual belief goes, with not a shred of credence in any form of supernaturalism, religion, spiritualism, transcendentalism, transcend, transcendentalism, metapsychosis, metapsychosis, or immortality. The only one I don't know, what the fuck is metempsychosis? All I say is that I think it's damned unlikely that anything like a central cosmic will, a spirit world, or an eternal survival of personality exists. They are the most preposterous and unjustified of all the guesses which we made about the universe. 
and I am not enough of a hair splitter to pretend that I don't regard them as errant and negligible moonshine. In theory, I am an, I am an, I am an agnostic, but pending the appearance of radical evidence, I must be classified practically and provisionally as an atheist. Interesting. I guess that makes a lot of sense why he wrote about this shit. Me when I'm a door. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish. Oh, it's Dagon? I always said Dagon. Dagon. Dagon, Dagan, was the main deity of the Philippines, <laughs> of the Philistines, worshipped throughout the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagon was a common noun for grain. The rulers of Akkad, of Akkad, Mesopotamia, chose him as the patron saint of their war conquest. He also appeared as the judge of the dead in um, As Asriri. Oh, that sounds really familiar. Assyrian. What is Assyrian? It is... Oh, right. Ethnic group indigenous. Oh, right. It's just Mesopotamian people, I guess. Syriac people. Okay. Um, and an underworld prison... Oh, sorry, what? He also appeared as the judge of the dead in a Syrian poem and an underworld prison... War a prison warder in one of the Babylon Bab Babylonian texts. He is often mistakenly taken for a fish god due to, th due to the wrong interpretation of his name. As in Hebrew, the word dag means fish. I always thought it was a fish god. That's why that's why I thought it was a fish, not a big monkey. In H.P. Lovecraft's words, D D Dagon is an underwater deity ruling, ruling over the deep ones. A, a humanoid race with fish straits with fish I'm I'm losing my my <laughs> A humanoid race with fish traits that resides in the oceans. He is worshipped by a secret cult called the Esoteric Order of Dagon. I would love to be in that damn cult. The Esoteric Order of Dagon? Hell yeah. Why is there bells? Okay. I'm just looking around for more shit. Vaporwave. I love vaporwave. I love, I love busts. Okay. But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. Where are my feet? The marketer. Lovecraft's attempts to find a job in 1925 were influenced by advice he received from friends, among others. He started freelancing for a marketing magazine where he could write announcements and commercials free. Oh, feel free to judge his copywriting skills for yourself. From an ad for Curtis Wordworth. Curtis Wordwork embraces both the usual instructional units and the cleverest contravents. This is for an advertisement, or of built-in or permanent furniture such as bookcases, dressers, buffets, and cupboards. Every model is conceived and created with the purest art, ripest scholarship, and mellowest craftsmanship, which energetic enterprise can command, and made to confirm rigidly to the architecture of each particular type of home. The cost, considering the quality, is amazingly low, and a trademark on the individual pieces prevents any substitution by careless contractors. See, that's good writing. I don't know if that's good writing for a goddamn advertisement. Maybe in 1925. I don't know. I wasn't alive then, unfortunately. August Derelith and the Cthulhu Mythos. August Derelith was an American writer and anthologist. He also befriended Lovecraft and published many of his works throughout his company, Arkham House. Although he greatly contributed to the popularization of the author's works after his death, he is surrounded by numerous controversies. <laughs> See, I feel like all I feel like all of these people are uh, surrounded by numerous controversies. One of his most questionable decisions involved introducing the good versus evil doctrine. Derelith was a devout Catholic to the Cthulhu mythos, which contradicted with Lovecraft's view of the world and his approach to cosmic horror. As a result, the author's works are often misunderstood and misrepresented in today's culture. Unfortunately, yeah, it would be pretty cool to live in that time. I could be friends with Lovecraft. It is also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really interested in creating a mythology, and the term Cthulhu mythos was coined by Derelith after the author left the mortal plane. Interesting. It's actually very interesting. I didn't know that. Oh, that's the Necronomicon. 
<laughs> I didn't I didn't see that at first. Hello, Necronomicon. I would love to have one of those. Should I buy one? I don't have money. I just spent all my money on Woody cassettes. No, I spent like a tenth of my money on Woody cassettes. I say cassettes, it was one cassette. Hello. The scientist. These days the word scientist is a widely accepted term, but at the time Dagon was published, it was subject to wide debate. After the author used it in the story, critics pointed out that man of science was a more appropriate term to deploy. He admitted in defense of Dagon that if Dagon were to be reprinted, he would indeed use the phrase they suggested. Scientist was coined as an analog to artist to be used when referring to those studying different branches of science. Yet in the 19th and early 20th century, scientific researchers in Great Britain and the United States were of the opinion that man of science resembling the term man of letters was the only proper choice. Among other things, it was gender specific, indicating that science was endeavored to be pursued by only one sex. The term scientist became more accepted only after World War II and man of science started fading out into obscurity as an old fashioned synonym. Women can't be scientists. Inbees can't be scientists. Anything else can't be scientists. Fuck you all. Cat self can't be a scientist. Especially no. The moon is gibbous and waning, but I see the thing. I tried morphine, but the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. So now I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Lovecraft on tobacco and alcohol. Lovecraft hated tobacco. Even though he used to smoke when he was 12 in order to look and feel like an adult, in his correspondence with a friend Reinhardt Kleiner, he claims that he quit as soon as he started wearing long pants. <laughs> the 1900s are so weird. It's like, oh, I'm going to smoke? Okay, but I can't wear long pants. He also had a very strong opinion about alcohol, as evidenced by his letter to Zelia Brown, dated 13th February. 1928. As for the matter of drinking, I have never tasted intoxicating liquor and never intend to. Having a strong aesthetic disgust at anything which blunts or coarsens the delicate natural equipo equipoise. What is an equ what is an equipoise? Lovecraft. What the fuck are you saying? It is balance of forces or interest. No, okay, that makes sense. Of a evolved human intellect and imagination. Drinking excited my personal re repugnance, hence I don't drink. Let the herd do what they will. I am rather in favor of prohibition. The prohibition of any one antisocial force as well as of any other. Okay, let's um, end the story. Often I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed. Worshipping their ancient stone idols and carving their own detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water-soaked granite. I dream of a day when they may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war-exhausted mankind. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. New York has been taken over by the monsters. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door, 
as of some immense slippery body lumbering against it. somewhere it shall not find me god that hand the window the window That scream was kind of funny, I'm sorry. <laughs> that scream was kind of funny. We hope you enjoyed immersing yourself in our little pool of cosmic horror. We would appreciate it if you took a moment to rate Jack on and check out our other games if you'll see him. Yeah, that was awesome. That was fucking awesome. I love that story so much. Yeah, whenever they release the... Uh Free DLC, I'll definitely play that as well as uh, the paid one. So I didn't get all of the uh, trivia pieces, though. Okay, I, I want to get the last trivia piece before I stop for today. I have this on my hard drive. I keep forgetting. Oh, hello. And scary stories have been what the fuck is this? Centuries. They have many faces and forms. Why is it so loud? But what is their purpose? Why do we enjoy being afraid so much? Because it's cool. During our therapy. I'll try to get Oh, I see. Right, yeah, this is their upcoming game. So I got... Unlock. What do you mean unlock? You can unlock all trivia in the category, but you won't get associated achievements. No. So, oh, I, oh, I'm just missing one. I assume this is just at the end because I quickly went to the window instead of looking for trivia. Because I wanted to, you know, be immersed or whatever the fuck. Um, can I just like... Oh, I think I have to I play through the whole thing. Unless, it, unless I can just like get it here. Somewhere. I don't want to look up a Steam guide because that's lame. I got that one, right? Yeah. Penniless. I can just skip through the text though. Do not think when you Let's see. Yeah, morphine. Tell me about yeah, it's just at the end. <laughs> I was like, oh I'm gonna go to the window. There's not gonna be a fucking little secret. That's okay. The Great War. I get to see all the scenes again. When I finally know. How do I? Yeah, yeah, there we go. The weather. <laughs> but. <laughs> I, sl I love the, the like clipping when it counts when it when it. Oh, fishy. was putrid with the carcasses of decaying fish and of other less describable things which I saw protruding oh look it's a snail mud of the unending oh, yeah look like it look at these little Perhaps guys Perhaps I should not hope to con there was nothing within hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of I hate the sounds though it's like mayonnaise Does this sound like I guess it was mushier, that's why. Detail, I like it. I like the detail. It gets less mushy when it's less mushy. It goes from mayonnaise to like mustard. That night. Does mustard have a sound? I don't know, it just sounds like mud. By the fall. I know not. 
I would love to speedrun this game. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. Actually, I've played a lot of like boring speed games. Said that the unbroken Not like the boring speed games, but like speed games that like don't require like a lot of route diversion, like you know, like RPGs, like short RPGs, where it's just you have to memorize the path and get really good at doing the inputs quickly. And this would probably be the most boring one, because at least with those you like still control a character. With this, you just I mean, it's just point and click. Which is, you know, good, that's fine, but it's not good for a speed game. That it was We're almost there. Kind of. Like halfway there. Oh, excuse me. I've been drinking too much water. The writing was in a Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown. Plainly visible across the intervening water on account of their enormous size. Though the creatures were shown disporting like grotesque beings. I can actually bring up my uh Poe or oh, a Okay, never mind. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented a Okay, let's continue. I see this little guy. We loathsome. It darted like a stupendous about which it flung its gigantic scaly arms, the while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. It feels so wrong just doing this while just skipping all of it. Even though I just played it because it's so beautiful, but like... I believe... Let me... go. I have indistinct recollections of a great storm. <gasps> oh, I'm getting tired. I'm gonna end stream after I, uh, get this last trivia fact. Trivia fact that feels like a, um... What is it when it's like you say when I came out of the shadows it's like when you say like in my delirium I uh, beautifully much. ugly it's like the opposite of that where you just say two things next to each other that are the exact same thing does that make any sense one sec okay all right where do I continue over here an idiom is that what it is I don't think that's what an idiom is. A group of words established by usage as having a meaning not deductible from those of the injured words. Over the moon, see the light. What? An idiom is a phrase that expression that largely or exclusively carries a figurative or non-literal meaning. Yeah, that's not what I'm on about. Um... It's like a double negative, but it's like a double positive. <laughs> is at night. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that's fair, actually. Okay, so here I should be able Often, to get it. I ask my... A mere... I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering at the nameless things that may at this very moment be crawling. Of a day when the land shall sink and the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. Maybe it's here, actually. Can I interact with the fishy? No. Can I interact with the New York? No. The end is near. I hear a noise at the door. Let's see. Maybe there's something I can get here before I interact with the door. I don't want to miss it. I don't have to go through the whole thing again. If I miss it this time, then I'm looking at a fucking steam guide. Okay, I don't see anything with my eyeballs. It shall not find me. Okay. 
God, that hand. What if I just don't go out the window? Here's another ending. The window, the window. Let's see, can I find any trivia? I don't, I don't, I'm not seeing any damn trivia. Yeah, I don't. I'm gonna check the Steam Guides. Let's see, what do we got? Steam Guides. I got 100% achievements. Sure. What do we got? Older Sony. I don't have. Oh, okay. It's literally right here. But I can't interact with it now. <laughs> Fuck. God damn it. Well, let's, uh, oh, I can save and exit. That would have been useful to know. Fuck. I wonder, when does it have my save point? <laughs> does it save me the exact time or does it have like chapters? Let's see. Continue. I hear a noise at the door. Okay, yeah, here we go. As perfect. Maybe body. perfect? Can I can I find the elder sign, maybe? Where the hell is it? Right there? Oh no. God damn it. Yeah, so in the tobacco and alcohol scene. Okay. Is there a faster way to go through all this shit? Okay. Worst part is that I have it on my hard drive, so it takes 10 years to load. Okay. Is it even worth it? Honestly, I, I don't even care right now. I'm just gonna fucking... <laughs> I'm just gonna unlock it here and then get it another time. Elder Sign, wowee. Another house where people were stirring. He asked questions about the gods and whether they dance often upon Lyrion, but the farmer and his wife would only make the Elder Sign and tell him the way to Nier and Ulthar. Elder Sign is a protective symbol that can be found in various works of pop culture, usually represented by a five-pointed star with an eye flame symbol in its center. For example, in games inspired by H.P. Lovecraft's writing, it is supposed to be to ward away all kinds of cosmic horrors. However, this is a later version of the sign created by the author's friend, writer August Derleth. Fuck you, Derleth. In our game, we have used the original symbol as designed by Lovecraft in the form of a six-pointed branch, which he sometimes included in letters to his friends. That's crazy. Imagine getting a letter with the, with the fucking elder sign on it. Okay. Oh, I don't... Oh, I didn't get these. Actually, I missed like four. Oh, fuck. Well... Okay. Dagon seems to be inspired by Fishhead, a short novel by Irvin S. Cobb about unnatural affinities between a hybrid idiot and the strange fish of the isolated lake. Supernatural horror and literature H.P. Lovecraft. And Lovecraft's dream about a strange island emerging from the ocean and him crawling in the ooze that covered its surface. I dream that whole hideous crawl and yet can feel the ooze sucking me down. Lovecraft's interest in the topic stemmed from his aversion to fish and sea smells. In his own words, I have hated fish and feared the sea and everything connected with it since I was two years old, but I cannot recall what earlier experience gave me such profound and lasting aversion to the sea and seafood. The loner. Contrary to proper belief, Lovecraft was not an ever-frowning, eccentric, grumpy loner. He considered himself to be a person who appreciated humor. Humor. Moreover, he would often meet with friends in his apartment or at various cafes in Brooklyn and Manhattan. At times, his social life was so intensive, his work could suffer for months. There was a point when he finally decided he needed to put an end to his daily meeting and loitering in New York cafeterias and resorted to hiding at home and reading with the main room light turned off, pretending he wasn't there whenever a friend knocked on his door. He also had another method of deterring his guests, which involved greeting them in a bathrobe, which, with an unmade bed visible in the background and piles of paper scattered across the floor. Yeah, well, probably people probably thought that because back back in like the in his early career, like nineteen twenties, he was fucking miserable because he had moved to like New York. 
Piltdown Man, or the, uh, Lovecraft would often use the latest scientific discoveries as inspiration for his works. He would even update his stories at the last moment in order to make sure they reflected the latest break breakthroughs. Unfortunately, this method was not without its flaws. After Lovecraft's death, the Piltdown Man discovery mentioned in Dagon turned out to be a paleoanthro paleoanthropological fraud. What the hell is the Piltdown Man? Let's see. Yeah, Piltdown Man was a paleoanthropological hoax. Um, bone fragments were presented as the fossilized remains of a previously unknown early human. Although there were doubts about its authenticity virtually from the beginning, the remains were still broadly accepted for many years, and the, falsid the falsity of the hoax was only definitely demonstrated in 1953. In 1912, oh, wait, yeah, it tells me about that. In 1912, Charles Tom, god damn it, an amateur archaeologist announced that he had discovered the missing link between ape and man, the fossilized remains of the previously unknown early human. Years later, they turned out to be a forgery. By that point, the fraud had already managed to negatively affect the early research on human evolution. In the year where the discovery took place, the majority of the scientific community believed Dawson indeed found the missing link. In 1953, Time magazine published evidence proving that Dawson was a con man. It turned out that the fossils of the previously unknown human of a hu uh, or the previously unknown early human consisted of a human skull, the jaw of an orangutan, and chimpanzee teeth. Okay. What is the Spotify link, Claire? It's a link to Piltdown Man by Francis Quinlan. And this is about the Piltdown Bones? Pilt, Pilt Man Bones? Piltdown Bones? Okay, that's that's all for that. And deal.